Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to get going now with our final session. Uh, we have uh, one hour now to think, uh, I hope in a more positive and energetic way, uh, about the possibilities for the future. What responses can we make? What things can be done to make a difference to this crisis? So um, I'd like to start off our discussions um, by inviting um, my colleague here, Halmarat, uh, to talk to us very briefly about his own experiences and as an activist. And I will break with the uh, convention today and um, just say a couple of words about Halmarat. Uh, he's uh, a Uyghur activist based in Finland, and he was among the first to really speak out in the diaspora about his own parents' detention. Uh, and that experience really spurred him to enter this world of activism. And um, I, I got to know Halmarat's work really through his very successful Me Too Uyghur uh, campaign, which was rolled out especially across social media, and I think really made a big difference to mobilizing the Uyghur community uh, across um, borders. So Halmarat, thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, can you hear? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for organizing this event. And uh, I really privileged and honored to be part of it. And uh, thank you for the audience to coming here. Uh, my name is Halmarat. I am actually born in a quite secular Uyghur family. I never uh, witnessed my parents actually practice any religion. So it's a little bit, you know, the controversial, like what uh, other panelists try to highlight that it's more or less Islamophobic and it's main, how to say, uh, well, it's not the main reason why we are being targeted. I mean, like before the, some, how to say the, I'm kind of from the privileged families that we never been targeted by the Chinese Communist Party because Chinese Communist Party actually selectively targeted uh, some group of Uyghurs until uh, 2017. So uh, I wasn't an activist until 2017. First, my mother uh, detained in a concentration camp. So in the beginning, I really don't know what it is. I It was my birthday, April, beginning of April, and I tried to contact uh, my mom because we have family tradition that every year when it's my birthday, I call my mother and ask her bless me, and she bless me, and I give thanks, uh, I give thanks to her to bring me to this world. I don't know this world is such an awful place. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, 2017 at April when I tried to reach my mom, nobody answered the call, then I called my father, then I learned that my mom was sent to somewhere like a study facilities. That's what my father told me. And uh, it was like, my mom is a retired civil servant, like the, used to work for Trupan Daily newspaper. Ironically, it is a uh, Chinese Communist Party owned propaganda machine. So my mom worked for the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda machine entire her life. Uh, then at the end, ended up uh, in a concentration camp. So. Uh, why we, I mean like the, in general, overall, why Uyghurs so slow to act? Why nobody stand up at uh, 2017? Because we didn't really know what is really going on because uh, there are, you know, the lack of information uh, because uh, we cannot reach out to our homeland to ask people. Uh, people all of a sudden block me from their WeChats and uh, when I try to call my friends uh, after, you know, they, they hear my voice without saying goodbye, they just hang up. And uh, I somehow I find a way to know and to confirm that my mom was really sent to the, one of these study facilities, so-called. Then uh, I, I try to find more information uh, to understand what it is. Then I ask uh, other Uyghurs who live at diaspora at abroad, and many of uh, Uyghurs from the diaspora, they have at least one or more relatives are actually being sent to those facilities. Then I went to uh, talk to you know uh, some uh, human rights organizations and uh, some uh, uh, politicians. One thing in the beginning really offended me because 
when I trying to tell them that there are this kind of mass detention happened and thousands of people, possibly even more, are being sent to somewhere called re-education camp or study facilities, and they say, oh, we don't know because no, no one else actually uh, came to us, or no one else, no one else from the Uyghur community talking about this. And they, they haven't asked me about, is your parents so religious? Is your parents are, you know, have uh, political ambitions? No, they are not. They were enjoying their retirement. Uh, then I feel so offended and uh, I start to have a question why my fellow Uyghurs do not stand up. And I start to make a videos, upload it to social media. Within a couple of months, I guess, over 100 videos I recorded and uploaded social media, I tried to encourage my fellow Uyghurs to start to speak up. Uh, I started to talk about this openly beginning of 2018 after my father to detain in concentration camp. And uh, right after my father detained in one of those concentration camp, I guess it's about two weeks later, uh, my grandma passed away and uh, I don't have anything to worry about. And my mom, uh, sorry, somebody tried to call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe very important call. <laughs> I will answer later. <laughs> then, uh, so I, uh, people start to give testimonies and uh, uh, then the, the Xiao and Zhang start to post this, uh, uh, pictures of the satellite images and the world start to know about this, uh, what is happening. Uh, when, uh, then I started this uh, campaign called Freedom Tour, which started from Helsinki. We, uh, it is actually a serial demonstration. Uh, I went to almost all major Western European countries, uh, 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 major capitals, except England. Uh, you know, English Channel, I once again successfully stopped at me, like throughout history, stopped at the other Europeans try to come to England. So I wasn't able to go through. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then, uh, Wherever I visit, I talk to local Uyghurs, Uyghur community, and uh, uh, hear so many uh, sad stories and uh, encourage them to stand up and speak up against what is happening to their relatives. And it's not a crime, even according to Chinese law, you can, you know, the, in search of your relatives who are disappeared. So then the media start to get attention and uh, uh, I don't know how many journalists interviewed me after I start to become an activist. Then, uh, 24th December 2018, my, both my parents have been released uh, in the same day. And after that, I start to have this big dilemma whether should I continue my activism or should I just stop and disappear? But before, you know, the, until this point, I went to different countries. I met with so many Uyghurs. I heard so many tragic uh, stories, their uh, families' uh, stories, and that, that some of them actually themselves experienced unbelievable things. Then I start to have this responsibility. I start to change, and I start to want to take uh, more risk to uh, try to contribute my community. I was enjoying my life uh, without, uh, you know, to have any ambition to get involved with even the human rights activities before, like until 2017. I wasn't part of any organization until now. I'm not part of any Uyghur uh, political uh, organizations. I never involved with the Uyghur political movement, not like the other Uyghur activists. They've been contributing for the Uyghur cause, uh, you know, the how many years, like 10 years, 20 years. I started only 2017. Uh, then, okay, then I continued, then the, then this uh, chance appeared in February. I started, uh, I launched the Me Too Uyghur campaign. And all of a sudden, within 24 hours, hundreds of over thousand, maybe a few thousand Uyghurs start to post about uh, their relatives who've been missing, who've been possibly sent to concentration camp, or who've been detained in the prisons or the, uh, sentenced to the prisons. 
then uh, the other day, uh, the media, uh, big media start to call me, like New York Times, CNN, come on, what's happened? Then all of a sudden, uh, this uh, become one of the shifting point that uh, Uyghur cause or the, the Uyghur plights that we are facing now, the Uyghur problem, become one of the folks on the media. So I guess I should stop here, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes to uh, stimulate uh, your thinking, to uh, reflect uh, very briefly on some of the suggestions, the ideas, the, the themes that have come up, at least for me, during today. So um, I think one thing that um, really struck me in our conversations was this um, uh, debate about ways of thinking about things, ways of naming things. I think that's extremely important. We had a suggestion of how people adapt to living in a post-truth world. So the, these very stark contrast between ways of naming schools uh, or concentration camps or genocide uh, as opposed to a very successful anti-extremism policy. You know, you see these um, Chinese tech firms framing their work as leading the world in counter-terrorism. So, I mean, it's just remarkable to, to reflect on these very kind of divergent and parallel uh, conversations that are going on. Is there any possibility of making these um, divergent naming practices meet, of having a dialogue across these, these different practices? Um, so in, in the same uh, vein, I, I thought there was a very interesting um, caution from one of our speakers tomorrow, to, uh, sorry, this morning, it's been a long day, this morning, <laughs> not so long ago, um, talking of the problem of how human rights in China gets invoked in the West, uh, and really how we should be thinking instead about um, how questions of human rights and how they're um, discussed, how these relate to market access questions and questions of power politics. So I think that's very important. Um, I thought this afternoon's panel, you know, there was, a, there was a little sense of, you know, a lack of empowerment somehow, a sense of, you know, so many things that will not work for us. So perhaps we can start from there. Please don't rely on the law, I heard someone say. It'll take years to get anything done and the damage is done long ago. So that is salutary. Um, academic arguments is, will not get things done. I heard that from the audience. Uh, also a useful reminder. Uh, but in, um, in response to that, perhaps, this sense that civil society is our best way forward. Um, can we unify these struggles? Um, we, we've heard the, the difficulties, of course, of taking this forward within China itself. But of course, we are all part of these transnational communities now. And perhaps there um, is... Um, where our, our effective models lie. So the, the, uh, the campaign, the BDS campaign against Israel was a very um, interesting example. The suggestion of following the money, of course, was very interesting. So just to hark back to this question of um, naming, uh, I think the, the idea of a Uyghur activist you know, is, is, is a rather new name in my experience, which has come up in the last few years. You know, Hamarat and many within our, our own community here in the UK. And, you know, I think those, um, that idea of Uyghur activism is, is very powerful and is making uh, a lot of difference. So, um, really, I think it was in the second panel this morning, um, that for me had, you know, the greatest energy and the greatest sense that there was a possibility for change. Perhaps it is because these um, problems of technology, these are quite new problems. And so there is still a sense that, you know, the, um, there, there is a possibility to really do something about these issues that are coming up. Um, so there were some very specific things raised here. Is the problem about the technologies themselves or is it just about who uses them? I think that is an important one to f reflect on. And we should indeed, uh, as some people suggested, be having conversations within universities about this, as well as, of course, um, uh, pursuing these companies 
uh, in all sorts of ways. So again, in terms of these parallel conversations, you know, we have these regional conferences, we have conferences with a, a human rights um, focus, but of course it is the, the colleagues working in STEM subjects, as, as has already been mentioned, who uh, are really the ones who should be uh, really made to be more aware of these issues. Yeah, so that um, is the sum of my, my thoughts so far. Um, I think we haven't spoken enough about forced labour um, today. I think this is really the, the, the big uh, and very fast developing issue. And I hope perhaps that we can spend some of the time, the next uh, uh, 40 minutes or so, just um, to, to include that in our discussions. So um, can I please... Um, Oh, can I please ask for our students with their roving mics to return where are they? So far, that is great. So can I ask then for um, any thoughts and uh, suggestions from the floor? We'll take, um, again, uh, two or three. No, in fact, this is an open conversation. There is no response from the floor. So we'll just start over there, shall we, behind you, Sophia, and then move this direction. Mm. Hello. Um, sorry, it's a question for Hanmarat himself. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you're not from a religious background. In fact, it's a secular background. And yet when we looked at the conditions that were being placed as to who is a suspect, etc., they seem to be very much religious based. Is there any indication as to what was the reason perhaps that, you, that your parents were in fact um, put into this position? Yeah, okay. Uh, recently, the New York Times uh, released this uh, Kargilic uh, documents. According to those documents, if someone has four children or someone possessed, uh, for example, passport, the Chinese passport, which is legal in China and all over the world, I think, then uh, if someone who have uh, uh, receive it calls from abroad or try to reach someone who lives at abroad. They also sent to the concentration camps. Uh, and China uses this uh, scoring, uh, well, these stalking people, and they have this uh, the system of uh, scoring people. If someone uh, who's in, in their circle is uh, uh, market as rat or the dangerous, then the one who maybe lost their points. And uh, uh, the Chinese officials, these stalking people and they give points to people and their comments on people uh, that could be resulting at the end that the person could be sent to one of those concentration camp or not. And uh, in my, uh, my parents' case is like, because I, I live in abroad, I'm foreign national, and the CR are well educated, then they went abroad several times. Those two points could lost a lot of points. So uh, they accumulate all these minor crimes, and the C can classify someone who's dangerous or not. That's uh, right. Thank you, Hamara. I mean, I, I think that takes us straight back to the question of surveillance, of course, and technologies, and the way that these algorithms have such a powerful uh, control over people's lives. So thank you. There was a question there. Uh, um, comment. A quick point. Uh, the chair has just mentioned the expression transnational communities. Doesn't um, the kind of a uh, trope um, encounter a deep problem, namely that right now one of the features of uh, the cultural um, uh, fights and the international struggle is the resurgent of identitarian notions. We have identitarianism uh, rampant worldwide. I mean, even in this country, uh, like an immensely tolerant, uh, at least on the face of the country, we have Brexit as put back the notion of identity, English, British identity of the kind. So how do we, does it not come down at the end of the day to who wins? How are we going to fight out this identitarian uh, plague 
worse than uh, uh, coronavirus in a way, I would say. Uh, in which ways are we going to fight this battle? That's great, thank you. Was there another question down there? Yeah? Uh, the, the, the other gentleman down here, I think. Oh, there's a lady there, go on then. No, no, not uh, in front of you, sorry. The gentleman had his hand up. No? Have you d taken that away? Okay, the lady who you, sorry, the lady you, you were first speaking with then. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hello. Um, first, I would just like to say thank you for having this um, question of how, what the future holds. And I was wondering for you, um, Halmarat, wh what you saw the impact of the Me Too Uyghur movement was and if you feel like social media is a way in which we can move forward. Um, and I know that we talked a little bit about how the state uses technology to surveil and I was wondering if social media or what kinds of technologies can be used to surveil the state um, and to hold the state accountable and if technology has a role. Okay, great. Thank you. Perhaps we can go to Aziz now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I have no questions. I have the, except I have uh, my point. Yes, we covered many uh, topic uh, about the Euro crisis. But I would like to say one even more urging, which everyone's concerned here about coronavirus. As we know, only we know about 80,000 Uyghur young, uh, young uh, mostly girls, and some of, some of them are boys from Khotan region, sent to, the, sent to work in the Chinese factory for labor. But, but there's uh, estimated at least, uh, and, uh, NGO organizations report is 1.8 million innocent Uyghur citizens are inside Chinese concentration camps. And we also estimated at least more than 3 million Uyghur people are in the camps. Now in Ulja, in the north, in Karmai, Urumqi, Kashkaviu, here you now, camps have lots of video clips now. People are starving, people are not allowed to go, to go to the street, and some people are even dying. And uh, now we are hearing as well the, the coronavirus is hitting the concentration camps now that people, are, we could not imagine that the, the consequence, what consequences will be. So can we talk about this? This is a matter of life and death for the innocent people overcrowded, already corrupted. Uh, over a few years they are inside the camp. Uh, it already is a very poor condition, not any kind of, uh, they are very easily catch the virus. That was uh, my most concern today. We can, I would be appreciated. We can talk about this. What can we do about this? Raise awareness. Any new idea will come up today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think it is very important to raise awareness of that. Um, since we are meant to be focusing in this session on actual um, mechanisms of, of strategies moving forward. I wonder if I could now invite um, Nicola McBean to have a chat because I know that she's been uh, engaged in some, some um, activities. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, and, and first of all, thank you very much uh, for uh, to everyone for today's um, meeting, which has um, certainly given us um, an awful lot to think about. Um, I should just briefly say, um, yeah, I'm Nicola, um, I run the rights practice, and um, we're an NGO in the UK. We um, support um, sort of human rights in China. Um, and we're not primarily an advocacy NGO, and I think that's been kind of one of the challenges um, for us as a sort of civil society organization to find ways to respond because we don't have huge amount of expertise in how to kind of undertake the kind of advocacy which I think is, is needed because, as Ava said earlier, um, it's so difficult um, for a whole host of um, reasons about the kind of country China is for the kind of activism within China um, to, to put some pressure on, on the government. So, so that strategy, and that's an area where we've been as an organization more active in supporting human rights lawyers and civil society groups in China. Um, so we've had to sort of, so I think for a lot of our, for, for us, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of been a challenge. Um, perhaps just um, reflect briefly and, and um, um, on a couple of the things that we've been trying to do. I mean, I think 
raising awareness has been um, a central concern and, and certainly um, Rachel um, was one of the participants in the panel we, we did back in 2018, I think, when we started um, engaging with the British Parliament um, and trying to get parliamentarians con um, to sort of be more aware of the issues. Um, I think I was struck by Penny's comment about, um, earlier about the genocide being a process. I, I think our response also from civil society is also very much a process. And particularly when, you know, I suspect all of us, um, you know, we were working on China. We hadn't sort of engaged on this issues or thought about strategy and response. And so we've all been trying to, to learn. I would like to sort of reassure people that there is quite a lot of concern going on at the moment and I think it's moved on now from initially um, the sort of civil society concern being focused on what, um, you know, amongst the, chi the sort of more China focused groups and there aren't that many of us and also with restructuring, Amnesty doesn't have very much very much presence here in, in, in that respect. So it's, it's, it's a small group um, who've been engaged, but that is broadening now. And specifically in response to um, the information out about forced labor, um, that has now um, mobilized um, a lot of the groups who are concerned with modern slavery, forced labor um, in this country. And, and that's also part of a a kind of transnational. So um, I can't go into the details, but I think you'll see shortly, um, I think, um, some evidence of, of people coming together, um, pushing brands um, to um, take, a, take a stand. Um, and so a lot of the background work is, is going on at the moment in trying to, to sort of put that together. So that's very much that engagement around sort of trying to get brands to um, that are engaging but that's on the probably more on the textile side I think there's a another piece of work that people are now thinking about I know some of them in the states are looking at this around the digital um, tech industry to um, but part of it's getting all the data um, so there's quite a lot of collaboration going on there are lawyers also in, involved in this um, I think again looking at um, pursuing legal strategies that look at complicity of companies. Um, so that's, that's uh, but all of this takes a lot of, quite a lot of time and resources um, for people to, to sort of look into it. But, but just to sort of say it's, it's out there, if people have um, particular issues, I mean, I think it's really important to keep MPs informed. There is quite a sense of concern, cross-party concern in Parliament, both in Commons and the Lords on it. It's not huge, but there are MPs who are really concerned, but they're not very well informed um, about details. They need, so really, I, you know, if you've got a way of communicating um, and, and come to me afterwards, we can put you in touch with people. Do keep them informed if you've got specific knowledge um, or suggestions of, of, of strategies they would, um, could, could under, you know, sort of um, follow. There is a group, there's an all-party parliamentary group looking at Xinjiang in particular. So um, they are trying to develop their strategy at the moment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Any more comments? Ah, I can see a couple. Oh, right, lots, okay. There's two bearded gentlemen there. Should we, should we like, give them their, their speech? Both very illegal beards. Two David as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, questions for Halmarat. Thank you very much for your presentation and, you know, I, I really admire your work. I think it's an amazing attempt, the hashtag, to reach a broader audience. You. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about how much attention it got amongst the Uyghur community. Um, but I wonder how you feel it was received beyond that, because it seems to me that is one of the primary issues now, how to reach an audience that is not as informed as ourselves. Thanks. Great. Um, actually, uh, Hamarat has had two questions, and I didn't give him a, res a chance to respond to the first, so perhaps you could take both of those together, if you okay. remember. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We took the social media for our advantage because it first, uh, everybody on social media, second, it's free, third, you know, uh, you can hide behind fake profile, so you can do different kind of activism. That is one thing Uyghurs are most comfortable of because 
uh, once there is oppression and if someone come up with resistance, then which follows by the retaliation. Not necessarily it comes to the person who live abroad, but to their re relatives back in our homeland. So uh, uh, social media campaigns, they help us raise awareness and the uh, media uh, reports, media outlets, uh, the documentaries, it helped us to raise awareness. But our intention is not just to let people feel bad. We really want people could involve it with what we are dealing with now, because uh, I don't want to demonize the, our enemy, but Chinese long arms already reached out to many other countries. First, uh, for example, many Uyghur activists are being threatened or intimidated by the Chinese government. So many are actually, you know, the, under threat and some are actually choose to stop their activism. So we really need uh, the people or the organizations or even countries could uh, help us, empower us, or at least facilitate us with uh, educate, educating us. For example, like the how to do advocacy to the different politicians or the different civil groups, how can we work together? And uh, like the, this, uh, from the, this Kashmiri uh, that uh, Mr. Uh, he asked it, and he was really dedicated to raise his own case. So we hope others who oppressed by the other authoritarian or the other regimes could sympathize each other, could understand each other. So we could do something together because it is something maybe global, like economically, like what uh, Mr. Darin studied, Uyghurs are marginalized uh, and uh, they become a subject of uh, the, how to say, the economic uh, exploitation. So I don't know, like, it's not only our problem. At the same time, China tried to legitimize uh, what they're doing to Uyghurs by uh, selling out a narrative that it is better way to counter terrorism. So I think this is the beginning of exporting their own identity to the other countries. Like what India do to Kashmir is now, it could be the first, very first example. And I'm afraid it would be in the future adopted by many other countries. We see uh, only 22 countries uh, signed the letter of rebuking China, but over 30 countries, uh, most of them are Muslim countries, are signed to sympathize and stand solidarity with China. Mm. I don't know what's behind that. Could be the, their, uh, how to say, the economic interest or diplomatic interest, or I don't know. But we really need more people will involve it with that. And it's a big challenge for us because we live in a remote place from the Europe and uh, most people, they don't really care uh, if something is not directly related to them. So, right, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank great, you. great. Let's leave some time for more questions. David, uh, still Thank, holding the mic. Thanks, yeah. Um, and, and this question would I would address to anybody that's presented today, Hamarad or, or anybody else. Um, you know, like a, like a lot of us, I'm an educator, and I, you know, view this as part of my responsibility to teach about uh, this to inform students, inform people who might not know. And sometimes it feels like you know you're just giving a litany of of terrible uh, facts about what's going on, and it feels very depressing. But I've always been encouraged that my students, whether here in the UK or previously in the States, um, frequently come up to me after the lecture on class day on this and say, "What can I mean, we didn't know it was this bad? What can we do?" And you know, you give them the same boilerplate response about you know make make sure that you write your MP or you you call your representative in Congress or or whatever. But I, I often wonder, are there things that we can do with our wallets, our our daily habits, like concrete, specific things that you know somebody asks us whether it's a student or a family member or somebody who wants to do something, what, what can we tell them is a step that we can take besides just the same usual things that we ask about? Mm, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Was there a question down here? Sorry. 
Hi, I'm Jonathan Liebenau from London School of Economics. I'd just like to reflect a bit on uh, the discussion about technologies, surveillance technologies and other kinds of technologies, uh, and, and point out that it would be completely wrong to think that the oppression of people would use anything other than the most modern technologies. The fact that uh, the Chinese have access to this technology is a representation of the state of their technologies. Of course, technologies are interesting because of the way in which they scale, uh, the extent to which they can uh, thor be thorough in, in certain kinds of analysis. But it's not really that different from the oppression of other people in previous times using what was then the latest technologies, uh, technologies of the media. Uh, the Jews of Berlin were rounded up because there was a post, uh, there was a book of addresses <laughs> which the community uses to keep in touch. It was a phenomenon of the postal system and the telegraph system. There are a few telephone numbers there too. Uh, and we should not, uh, I think, focus on what's special about the technologies. What we should focus on is the way in which resources of any kind are being used in order to uh, mobilize a policy and focusing then on the policies and the politics of it. Uh, I think that the effort to act, uh, promote activism through the relatively soft underbelly of the companies and the economic interests that are, uh, that are uh, presented is perhaps a good tactic, but it doesn't address the larger, profound, strategic concerns that we ought to have. Thank you very much for that. Um, again, it's that sense of follow the money. Uh, Dibiesh, there was a, up there. Uh, thank you. This is regarding your wider question around solidarity, way forward and everything. So I was thinking of my initial work was on Tibet, not Uyghurs. We can see commonalities and differences. One aspect of Tibetan struggle is that internationally it has got much higher profile. Compared to population, you'd see that there's a lot of support here in general. So that support comes with its own problems in terms of disciplining them and sidelining them and controlling them. But it's very much there. So I th do think that one thing which some of us are already working on, you, Rachel, you're there and Joe and some of us have been doing that is around focusing not only on Uyghurs or Tibetans or Hong Kong separately, but focusing on the, let's say, the victims of Chinese empire in general. So that's something we should do. Academically, we should do it together through workshops, through events like this. We should also do it through protests, exploring that option. So activism, academia, divide, so challenge that part. Look at that. But something else which I think I would refer back to, let's say earlier Natasha's uh, presentation or Penny's one later on Rohingyas. So not only look at, let's say, China and victims of Chinese empire, but maybe look at victims of uh, state crimes in China, uh, Myanmar, India together. So again, in terms of the kind of work people do on Kashmir or Assam or in a Rohingya or, or, or on uh, Myanmar. So that might connect, right? So broadly speaking, one is around China, second is around generally problems with uh, Asia. But that's something we can do. And I'll just invite you, though I'm not a Tibetan person, 10th of March is Tibetan Uprising Day. There's March from Downing Street to the Chinese Embassy. And Rahima is one of the speakers with Rahima. Oh, she's there, yes. And I'm also one of the speakers in solidarity. But uh, please join us if you can. No, that's on 10th of March. And you may find, and I'm giving example. In Strasbourg recently, there was a workshop organized by a European Youth uh, Association of Tibetans. Uh, World Uyghur Congress, Hong Kong protesters, uh, Tibetan uh, activists, and I was, I was also one of the people there. And the discussion there was so good, you could also see the commonalities part. I just was wishing, we wish we had that in the UK. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have more opportunity in the UK than in Europe, but we have to take that opportunity up. So I think, thank you very much for organizing this conference because it allows us to build those connections. Thank you, Diviesh. That's great. And uh, any, anyone else has any events to advertise while we're here? I'm very happy to hear. <laughs> Ava. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to come back to the um, point that Nicola made earlier about um, exposing complicity and perhaps pursuing legal liability of complicit actors like corporate actors who um, uh, use forced labor indirectly um, that, that comes from Xinjiang. Um, I think that um, 
there is um, there are more ways um, of of thinking uh, of, uh, about this, and I think um, exposing sort of using the complicity point really um, relies on the idea that um, we can get at actors who um, um, really can be um, compelled to uh, follow the law, um, and um, I think that um, for instance um, we could think of government authorities, um, like for example there was the great example of Ofcom, the media regulator, um, uh, essentially being um, uh, uh, sort of uh, being uh, made the subject of um, a legal complaint by um, Peter Humphrey, who had been coerced into a televised confession by, with collusion from China Global Television. This morning we heard from Aziz this, this really heartbreaking story about um, his mother uh, being coerced to do the same thing. Uh, we can get creative about um, uh, then going after the UK government authority that is responsible for giving a license to, you know, China China Global Television um, uh, opening up its, um, I think, European headquarters in Chiswick, uh, as, if, if, uh, as, I, as I recall, um, that sort of thing. So um, I also think that taking it sort of closer to that point, closer to home, we must think about um, the various ways in which universities have become complicit in, uh, for instance, the context of research on, um, let's say, surveillance technology. And we have to think about, um, uh, be it political or legal ways of um, uh, exposing uh, that potential complicity. And of course, that requires a lot of work, not least in terms of gathering the evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But um, those, I think, are very specific and concrete um, strategies that could be pursued. And um, just to mention uh, one more point, uh, not about complicity, but another potential strategy that I'm aware of uh, sort of that that uh, I understand is is it has been discussed, of course, and indeed um, to some extent been been used. Um, there is this question that um, human rights advocates ask themselves: if um, facing um, facing these. Um, hugely powerful um, actors like, you know, the Chinese party state, um, uh, there might be some uh, advantage in uh, trying to go after individual perpetrators. Um, so that would be, for example, officials within the Chinese party state who, um, let's say, um, want to travel here or open up uh, bank accounts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in that context, um, uh, uh, one approach that has been used um, has been the so-called Magnitsky legislation, so basically legislation that uh, empowers um, other governments, um, the US government, for example, to uh, then impose uh, travel bans or asset freezes. Now, I would say that, I mean, I wanted to mention this as a mechanism that is potentially available, but I would also like to say that I think it is a, a potentially highly problematic mechanism because, of course, it can be used um, uh, for a particular political agenda. And so, um, and it raises, um, issues, uh, it raises its own human rights issues uh, about how to identify perpetrators and then also why and how to hold perpetrators responsible who are actors within uh, an, a system that is itself highly repressive. Um, but nevertheless, I think it is something that, that ought to be considered. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Ava. I mean, as far as I understand, this has been, um, you know, this is part of the, the Uyghur Human Rights Bill, which is way, making its way through Congress rather slowly. But the EU has, is also introducing this kind of legislation. So it's good that these moves are afoot. I don't know where the UK stands in that now, of course, but, you know. Uh, uh, Rahim Air, there we go. Uh, I just would like to make some comments about looking to the future response to the crisis. And I believe we need to be uh, brave and loud. I think that's very important. Um, for example, I know it's very difficult to achieve something from the Chinese government. Of course, what we can do in this country and to change the mindset or uh, decisions. For example, just to share my experience. Um, when Boris Johnson announced uh, Huawei 5G network limited uh, access, I wrote to, immediately after I heard that announcement, I wrote to all the medias who, uh, uh, who interviewed me in the past. And then uh, straight away I got an uh, email uh, back from Radio 4. Uh, so the next day I spoke and I said the human rights 
issue has not uh, mentioned. It only talked about the security concern. And then someone, I'm not going to name, uh, a quite well-known journalist emailed me saying that, can we meet? And then he put me in touch with many um, important MPs. So I have been meeting them. And I think this is quite important. And it gives me kind of hope. And then I f it's also a feeling of some kind of achievement that give you sort of uh, uh, satisfaction. So I think people should uh, just take action when, when you is also, for example, on the 26th of March uh, in LSE, someone is uh, giving a lecture, pro Huawei lecture. So now we mobilized a one world movement and other uh, experts trying to also uh, uh, put, uh, I've been contacting people who are writing um, article about about Huawei and to get them there and then we we, we ask tough questions maybe have some uh, protest outside so uh, there are a lot a lot of things that we can do we just need to be uh, active for example on the 5th of February uh, no for February 5th of March two days ago uh, we held a demonstration outside the Chinese embassy, it's led by the uh, labor uh, movement. And after the report about the modern, uh, the, uh, what's, what's a slavery, a modern uh, report uh, act, and uh, the labor workers union, now they are trying to mobilize the, the, the whole union members to, to take action. We walked, uh, marched to Oxford, uh, Oxford Street, uh, handing leaflets and trying to tell people, to educate people that there are this forced labor is going on and maybe the, the, the uh, items you are buying is from forced labor. So there are hell a lot of things that people can do, but we need, we need a lot more people engage and uh, um, to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahima. Uh, um, I, I'd like now, please, to invite uh, Darren Byler, if I might, to just give us uh, some sense of the kind of activities he's been um, uh, observing or engaged with in the US, because I know a lot of work has been going on around surveillance and forced labor. So if you have a couple of comments, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, a, a few stories to tell. Um, so a week or two ago, I was uh, on the East Coast in a major city at a major institution talking to someone who is one of the leading researchers around uh, computer uh, vision, machine learning, those sorts of technologies. Really, she, she works on really basic technologies. And she wanted to know what she should do because um, reading what's about what's happening to the Uyghurs really made her feel horrible because she could see that like the sort of thing that she was working on was being used in these ways and she was wondering if she should just like leave her job and like go live on a farm and like not work at all on technology anymore because of the effects of it um and i was telling her no don't do that um you're in a position of authority to speak to these issues that very few people are able to to do I mean, because of her institutional standing um and that that is something that she should leverage, that she could begin to build a movement. But it's also illustrative of the kind of um, position that people of conscience are in, in technology industry, in machine learning, all of those spaces, that they're feeling quite embattled as well because they have to push back against these um, forces that are much larger than them. Um, so I think what we need is probably not like a, a con, sort of consumerist or individual individual approach to pushing back against this. Um, we need to organize um, at a larger scale and, and have collective actions. Um, and one of the things that's coming out of uh, the college campuses in the US is in April we're going to have a, uh, which I guess is at the same time as spring break here, we're going to have a, so it's not good internationally, but and we're going to have a collective action that will um, have a week of teach-ins on the Uyghur issue across college campuses all across the U.S. and in Canada. Um, and, and I th hopefully that will you know, really take this to another level in terms of awareness on campuses um, and will you know, 
bring bring a, awareness to this issue that, that maybe wasn't there before. And I think that's the type of actions that we need to really kind of move the needle on this. Because really, um, if we don't have sustained action, if we don't make the cost of doing nothing too high, um, we won't have responses. Um, at the same time, there's still so many, it, it never feels like it's enough. Um, so that's why we need to use all, 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 all approaches. Um, and it, so it's exciting to hear that the, the brands are being held to account uh, or will be at, at some point um, and that there's movements in government as well. Um, so that's kind of the state of things. That's great, Darren. Thank you. It's a shame we didn't manage to align with the, the U.S. Uh, teach-ins there, but we could, we could do a pan-European uh, teach-in, couldn't we? That'd be nice. Yeah. Um, we have time for a few more comments, I think, before we wrap up. Oh, yes, sorry. You're sitting so far back, I can yeah, hardly see you. So I thought I had to speak. Uh -uh. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, all that sounds really interesting. So pardon me in advance for perhaps sounding a note that's a little, uh, you know, that's a little sort of cynical, if not pessimist. I'm just worried about the fact that we are in this post-Brexit policy landscape, trade landscape, where challenging these things without, we are, of course, in a sense, craving for the, you know, the liberal hypocrisies even with all their selectiveness and hollowness. But at the same time, when you look at how things have been recently, um, is it is it realistic to just expect that sort of change to come from powers up when you think of India, think of China, think of these various countries doing these things, combined with the fact that there are you know there are these very good global alliances between these leaders. So uh, so partly I'm just I'm just a bit worried that we are you know we I want to be optimistic but I'm just thinking about the the actual. Uh, so in that sense, the person who spoke earlier before Dibesh Dibesh as well, but Jonathan. Uh, uh, you know, the, the thing is not just so much only technology. So technology is part of that story. But what the chief minister of the most populous state in India today did is that his, he approved it for his followers to just go and paste large hoardings of protesters with their names, addresses, and, and pictures. So technology is part of how these oppressions are happening, but low-tech oppressions are also equally, you know, kind of really violent and happening. So that so there's, there's I'm just, I guess partly I'm just saying that the technology and the state level things have to happen, but they're not all of that story for me. So I would say that given that even in a democracy, can you really elect a government that will make markets fail? Do you do you do we really expect that weapons sales will not shoot up every time these sorts of things happen? Sorry, I'm not I'm not like trying to rain on everyone's you know optimism, but I do want to say that this is real. Now, having said that. Having sounded that note, I do want to think of what can we do in sort of disruptive ways that actually does make this matter. And I think one of the ways in on the campus situation, since you know, being being an academic myself, I feel like why don't we have this sort of thing matter for the curricula? Why don't we have a concerted demand across universities from students or others to actually say, please teach us about Xinjiang. Please teach us, teach us about Kashmiris, teach us about Hong Kong, like make it matter, make it somehow required for people to actually find this out at a very kind of even basic undergrad level so that you don't just have five, uh, you know, PhDs and postdocs who know about it and a group of people who gather in a room. But these things have to like be somehow mandatorily part of how everyone is learning about what's going on in the world. So I would say at the level of ideas, doing something like that for me is building up out towards making things change. Otherwise, I, I don't really want to just be naive and think that this will change. So that's so I would want something like that to happen, like curricular level changes, education level changes, and also kind of more things around Chinese, um, again, this is, uh, you know, Xinjiang is your, your, maybe, I wanted to actually ask this of the second panel. So, you know, how do people in China, how, how, is it, isn't it possible at all to look at the ways in which consent, apart from intimidation, consent is created around this? Like, are there ways of non-coercive consent, which is kind of ideological consent, can that be somehow seen against the grain in these countries, India, China, wherever this is happening? I know with Trump and all of these people, it's just really hard. But I just feel that that is something that ought to also be on the story because, you know, a lot of the thing, the, the consent, the conditioning and the consensus part of that story is as important, although not either or, as the material and the other factors. So thanks. 
Thanks. Great. That's very. I think uh, we should um, give give a few moments voice to the uh, the remotes. <laughs> Or, or is it, is it um, Sophia herself? It's me. Also allowed. So the remotes um, gave up to us. Did they? They were still watching, but there were no, no comments. Um, no, I just wanted to say something very quick. I, I really agree with Natasha's points. I think these things need to be, and other um, issues in the world need to be brought into the curriculum in different ways. But um, one very specific, I had one very specific suggestion um, that um, could we make a pledge that um, people in different universities could sign to say any conference that mentions the Belt and Road has to invite somebody to talk about the Uyghur issue and, and that we will not tolerate a conference that is so intimately related to this repression that does not invite somebody who's going to um, talk about the repression, forced labor, et cetera. And that we, we in, I mean, we, that would be quite a simple thing to do, to create a pledge and try to get people um, in different universities to sign up to it. Yes, I support that idea. <laughs> well, um, I, I can see a few more hands up, but I think probably I should take Chair's prerogative now and um, start drawing us to a close, yeah? Yeah. So, um, thank you all very much. Um, this, this has been a really great crowd, not quite the, the numbers that we, we were expecting from the registrations, which is something interesting that we will explore. There's usually a bit of dropout, but we were expecting a much more crowded room than this. But um, the people who have been in the room have been fantastic, and I think most of you have been with us all the way through this, this day, so thank you. The audience, uh, thank you to our heroic technicians. Uh, you're still there. We really appreciate your, your work, guys. Thank you. Um, thank you to the South China Institute. We've said this already. Yes, we really appreciate um, the support, especially from, from our, our wonderful organisers uh, within the South China Institute and the CASH. Uh, thank you so much for our speakers. Uh, it has been really very interesting and quite wonderful to get these conversations going across different regions and different approaches. And I really hope we can do more of this. So thank you. Um, thank you to the organising committee. Um, Let's, let me name you all. Ava Pills from King's College London, Jude Howell from the London School of Economics, Sophia Woodman uh, from Edinburgh, uh, Matthew Burney from Queen Mary's, um, Tim Pringle from SOAS. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all you. So um, I think our emails are uh, available online. If you have any further suggestions or ideas or reflections on this conference, please do get in touch. And thank you again. <laughs>